greeting everybody. Uh, I hope you all had a nice uh, 4th of July. Uh, I hope that you all also did well on your uh, midterm test. Uh, what uh, our ambition is today is having looked at the different thermodynamic cycles that could be adapted to nuclear power generation, both present and uh, on the drawing boards and in our future. Uh, what I would like to do today is go and look at uh, the different uh, co concepts for nuclear uh, reactors. So I'm going to right away go into sharing the screen here. And uh, that would be the part in our lecture notes on the web where we look at fission systems. We have already covered the chapter on nuclear reactor concepts and thermodynamic cycles. Uh, we start with the two most common types of reactors that are being operated today, the pressurized water reactor and the boiling water reactor. Uh, these two types of reactors use light water as a coolant. And we specify here white, coal, uh, white water to differentiate it from heavy water. Uh, heavy water would contain the isotope of uh, hydrogen, which is a deuterium. So in that case, that is the heavy water reactor. Uh, that has been developed primarily in uh, Canada, and it's a very successful high capacity factor design. Uh, however, in our future, if we want to uh, develop a uh, fuel cell based type of transportation system, uh, we need to depend on hydrogen as a storage medium for uh, the energy produced from uh, nuclear energy, but uh, also uh, from uh, wind power systems and any other uh, uh, system for uh, the production of uh, energy. So uh, we'll cover these and then you'll find that uh, uh, the present generation of reactor is now being considered for upgrade into what's designated as a fourth generation reactor concepts. Uh, for the long term, if you want to have an, an, an infinite uh, energy supply, uh, we need to breed or to produce more fuel than what we're consuming. And the uh, nuclear energy presents us with a unique way of doing this. It doesn't uh, exist in any other uh, system of energy production. Uh, we're going to uh, consider uh, how is it that existing power plants, the pressurized water reactor, the boiling water reactor needs enrichment. And uh, enrichment meaning increasing the concentration of the uh, uranium-235 isotope uh, in the fuel that we use in light water reactors and in the future in fast reactors uh, in general. Uh, I'll look at some uh, also new developments in power generation like the use of floating nuclear barges, a traveling wave reactor that is being adopted by uh, Bill Gates uh, and uh, uh, the ideas of also using underwater power plants. We'll start with the most common type of a nuclear reactor in existence today, and we'll build on this to see how we can improve on the present design. Uh, the existing most common uh, most commonly used reactor is a pressurized water reactor. And in that case, uh, the water is intentionally pressurized. And uh, when you pressurize the water, uh, it does not boil at atmospheric pressure. It needs to reach a higher pressure to be able to boil. And in fact, that happens in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in cars when we use the, uh, the radiator coolant uh, the gas on top of the radiator pressurizes the water in the radiator and won't allow it to boil. However, uh, if you inadvertently open up suddenly the cap on the radiator, it is uh, suddenly depressurized and the water flashes. It turns instantly into steam and can, of course, burn your face. So you are warned about this. Uh, it happens also uh, if you shake a can uh, of Coke or any kind of soft drink, and uh, it is pressurized. However, if you uh, suddenly uh, decrease the pressure, you'll find that the carbon dioxide dissolved in the Coke or the 
uh, any kind of a soft drink would release itself uh, suddenly. So in that case, you have one phase flow that goes into the core of the reactor, a liquid. And uh, of course, under uh, situations of accidents, we can lose that coolant very easily. It would depressurize, say, if a pipe breaks as a result of an earthquake. As I suggested, uh, the pressurized water reactor is the most successful system. It's not used just on land-based reactors shown here in Japan, uh, but also in nuclear propulsion and uh, uh, district heating. And in the future, we'll see it used in the desalination of seawater and obtaining fresh water supplies. Uh, this is a site in Japan, uh, much better designed than the Fukushima site. You could see here uh, two uh, reactor uh, uh, double units. This is the containment vessel of a PWR, another containment vessel of a second PWR using concurrently the same uh, turbine plant. Uh, uh, basically, that would be the turbine plant. And another two units here. This is the Ohi Power Station Complex in Japan. It's not operated by Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, which ran the Fukushima. Uh, these two other units here, four PWR cooled by water from the ocean. But uh, the design here was much more judicious than the Fukushima accident. The Fukushima plants were built very close to the water level. So the tsunami came in. And uh, of course, we hear the story of the uh, the tsunami uh, causing the plant, the, the plant to uh, four units at the same time, basically domino effect to get damaged. So it's, it depends on the design and the effects of natural phenomena being taken into account from earthquakes to tsunamis to hurricanes and so on. As uh, this is uh, a conceptualization of how uh, a pressurized water reactor uh, interior of inside that containment vessel that I have shown you would look like. Uh, the size is enormous. Uh, so usually in drafting, we try to show the standard man. Uh, it shows here some entrance to the containment and this would be the size of a person relative to the size of the equipment. Uh, this would be here the reactor core with a lid on top of it uh, being held by a large number of bolts and nuts. Uh, on top of it, you'll find the hoist and uh, a system for raising uh, the fuel and then uh, inserting it into the reactor core. On top of the reactor core, shore heen inside the pressure vessel, you'll find control rods that would come in, uh, absorb neutrons or uh, not absorb neutrons to control the nuclear reactor. As I suggested, the water in that system is pressurized. So you'll find that within the piping of the primary containment, you have here a pressurizer. I'll show you the pressurizer uh, in more detail as we go along. But the water is not uh, producing steam anymore inside the core once you pressurize it. So you find that uh, we have one, two, three, four coolant pump that circulate the water from the core, it pumps it into the core, it gets into the core, exits the core, and goes to uh, two uh, heat exchangers here. So this would be a U-tube heat exchangers as we'll show it later. Uh, the coolant gets in, goes into a U-tube uh, that uh, has uh, 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 water. Uh, the two U-tubes is immersed in water. Uh, the heat transfer happens between the U-tubes in the steam generator and steam is generated an exit from the top out of the containment structure to the electrical part of the plant where it goes to the turbine to produce electricity by rotating the blades of the turbine. Uh, the power loop uh, usually uh, for reliability and for safety, uh, we use a minimum of two steam generators like in the previous uh, diagram, but here we are using four of them, one, two, three, four. So in the case of the pressurized water reactor, the water is not allowed to boil uh, inside the core by pressurizing it. How do you pressurize it? You just uh, get a, uh, a device called the pressurizer and you produce a bubble of steam on the top of the coolant there and uh, that uh, pressure distributes itself over the whole system. 
Uh, for reliability, you would use at least two steam generators or heat exchangers. Uh, this uh, the diagram shows four of them for reliability. One of them may be put out of order for maintenance temporarily in the reactor. So overall, uh, the plant has two parts, one nuclear island, as it's called, and one electrical island. Uh, the nuclear island contains the pressurized water reactor, the core, the pressure vessel, the control rods coming into it, the pressurizer, and the steam generators. Notice here I said U-tube, uh, there is a pump that pumps water into the core, and then it goes through some tubes that are immersed in water. That is where the steam is produced, it's taken to a high pressure turbine, to a low pressure turbine, and then the water to complete the uh, steam cycle is condensed in a condenser. Uh, once uh, you expand the steam on the blade of the high pressure and low pressure turbines, uh, you have it uh, on this, you have on the same axle, the electrical generator and you produce power to uh, the grid. Uh, the cooling here can take different shapes. Uh, it could be simply a body of water like a lake or a the ocean itself, like shown in the first the diagram, uh, this one uses a cooling pond. Uh, this is in fact the way that the power reactor at the Clinton plant west of town, if you have a chance you go visit their visitor center there, uh, 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 that's a cooling pond. But uh, most of the time they use uh, cooling towers as we'll show uh, maybe in the next chapter on boiling water uh, reactor. Each uh, one of the components is a marvel of technology. Uh, the first uh, important component is the pressure vessel itself. Uh, uh, the pressure vessel can be a single well uh, cast uh, item, or it could be parts that are welded together using explosive welding because it can reach 10 inches in thickness. And only a few companies in the world like Mitsubishi and Arriva uh, in France uh, can manufacture those uh, large pressure vessels. The core is at the bottom here. Uh, the coolant comes in from the pump. It goes through an annular region around the core, comes from the bottom, distributes itself in channels. There will be more flow near the center than near the periphery for a reason that will come clear later on because the power distribution is going to follow a vessel function of the zeros uh, 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 of the first kind of the zeroth order. So there is a peak in the center. And uh, so you use nozzles to distribute the flow so that you get the same kind of uh, quality or heating of the uh, coolant coming out of the core. And then it goes to the steam uh, generator. The control rods come from the top. Uh, the top has a lid on top of it held by uh, bolts and nuts are shown here. And uh, during maintenance, you uh, remove the attachment to the control rods after you insert them into the core and then you raise that top uh, set it aside and uh, refuel the system basically you take out the old fuel and you replace it with new fuel you, and you also shuffle the fuel because the power distribution that we'll see later peaks near the center then you'd like maybe to move the spent the fuel that is more spent from the center to the outside and place the new fuel uh, near the center. Uh, refueling takes uh, in a typical power plant uh, a, every year or every year and a half, whereas of course in uh, fossil fuel power plants, because the energy density or the specific energy is so low, uh, you need to continuously uh, bring in fuel, uh, 100 cars uh, of coal maybe a year for the same kind of uh, a power plant in terms of power as a nuclear power plant. Uh, looking at the core from the top, you'll find uh, the pressure vessel here, very thick. Uh, radiation from the center of the core, particularly neutrons can embrittle the steel. So we uh, provide a, uh, another uh, vessel, uh, if you want to call it, it's called the thermal shield. It shields the outside steel vessel from the effect of neutrons that can cause radiation damage uh, and uh, protect it also somehow from the thermal radiation. Uh, you have channels in which the coolant will flow and each one of those crosses here represents a control rod coming into the core. Uh, there are channels for instrumentation shown here too. 
So you measure the level of the power, the flow rate, the temperature, uh, and uh, the uh, pressurization of the uh, device itself, the core uh, itself. This is a, a typical fuel element. Like, uh, you, you, again, we go back here. Notice that we have uh, those channels here, those square channels. Each one of them contains a fuel assembly. And the fuel inside the core is the pellets of uranium dioxide uh, uh, surrounded by a cladding. So the fuel is UO2. Uh, there is a gap that's filled with helium as a thermal bonding between the temperature in the fuel. And it peaks again near the center and then comes down into the gap of helium, goes through the cladding. Uh, consider the cladding as a can. In fact, the British call it uh, the can in the United States, we call it the cladding, and then the temperature goes to uh, the coolant. So uh, each one of those fuel elements is placed in a long rod, uh, 17 by 17 array, as shown here for the pressurized water reactors. These are the fuel rods. They have spacers to keep them spaced from each other. And then the coolant comes in from the bottom and rises uh, over the surface of the fuel and the heat generated from fission is extracted into the flow of water. There is, the, as you could see here, a temperature drop uh, over something that's almost like one centimeter only in diameter, very small gap. Uh, the helium is, has a, two purposes here. Uh, the helium is acting as a thermal bonding. So the heat transfer occurs between uh, the fuel and the cladding. Uh, as well as a way when the uh, fuel elements are welded uh, as a way of detecting any leak by detecting the helium. Uh, uh, fuel, uh, typically uh, pressurized water reactors have uh, very uh, technical specifications that are typical of the plant. Uh, and uh, I would like us to compare uh, the tech specs or technical specification of the PWR later on to those of the boiling water reactor. Uh, typical uh, thermal power output is 38 megawatt thermal. And that's why in the test I have been checking and I've been telling you in uh, previous lectures that as engineers, we need to make a differentiation between megawatt thermal and megawatt electric. 38 megawatt thermal is not the heat that you can get, for, uh, the energy you can get from the plant. Uh, you have to consider the overall thermal efficiency. For uh, light water reactors, like in the exam, uh, it's typically one third or 33%. Uh, so if you divide that into three, say you get 1100 uh, megawatt. And in that case, it's not megawatt thermal anymore. It's megawatt electric. So as engineers, uh, we cannot just use what's called the rated power megawatt and stop there. We have to specify, is it electrical energy or is it thermal energy? Uh, the pressure, uh, as we suggested, the, uh, for the coolant, the water, uh, is a high pressure. It's pressurized to 2,250 pounds per square inch absolute, PSIA. Uh, the, you'll see later that the boiling water reactor, where we do not pressurize the water, we allow it to boil inside the core of the reactor, we operate at almost half that pressure, about a thousand pounds per square inch in uh, absolute. Uh, if we are going to use water, we have a detriment here uh, because the neutrons uh, are lost and the neutrons uh, uh, are our, uh, our way of generating the fission process, <clears throat> but they can get absorbed by the oxygen in the water. And in nature, uh, in one of the assignments, we've seen that uh, uranium contains 0.72% uh, of uranium-235, which is the isotope that primarily fissions in these types of reactors. So uh, to compensate for the absorption of the neutrons in the oxygen in the water, you'll find that we are going to enrich it, to increase the proportion of the uh, uranium-235 isotope in the fuel. And uh, from 0.72% in nature, uh, there are three levels of enrichment there in a typical PWR, 1.9% uranium-235, 2.4, and 2.9. So it's about an enrichment, let's say, of 3%. Uh, same for the boiling uh, water reactor. 
Now, why is it so? Well, it's an arbitrary number. We can enrich it to 20%, we can enrich it to 10%, uh, we can enrich it to 90%. That would be for naval propulsion uh, reactors uh, so that uh, we can have a long core lifetime as well as overcoming what's called the xenon dead time. A nuclear reactor cannot be restarted uh, if you shut it down for 24 hours to allow for the decay of one of the fission products, xenon, that has a very large absorption for neutrons, neutron cross-section, absorption, neutron cross-section. And uh, for 24 hours, you uh, cannot restart the reactor unless you have very high enrichment. This is designated as very high fuel reactivity. Uh, the coolant flow, as you could see, is quite high, 10 to the 8 pounds per hour. Uh, the inlet temperature is 565 degrees Fahrenheit, and the outlet temperature is 622. So it's only uh, a 60 degrees increase in the temperature, and it's rather a, a low temperature in terms of Fahrenheit. That would be about 350 degrees Celsius uh, in general. However, the maximum fuel temperature can reach 3,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, in general. Uh, this is if you are designing a 3WR, the tech specs of a typical uh, reactor, and uh, we'll compare it later on to the one for the boiling water reactor. So what does an actual nuclear power plant looks like as a PWR? You would have a reactor core operating at a relatively not high temperature at all, as I suggested, 322 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, pumps are circulated into the core exit the core, go to a heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, steam is generated. The steam followed that path here to a high pressure turbine. As it exits the high pressure turbine, it goes to a moisture separator, uh, to a reheater, and then fed into a low pressure turbine. And uh, both of them are producing 922 here, megawatt thermal, uh, 922 megawatt thermal. The shaft of the high, uh, uh, the high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine are both along the same shaft as the electrical generator rated at 1038 megavolt ampere. MVA stands for megavolt ampere. Having uh, expanded in the high pressure turbine and low pressure turbine, uh, the flow of the steam goes to a condenser uh, to turn the steam now into water. Uh, and through a condensate pump, it is fed through the regenerative cycle that we covered in the last chapter into a low pressure heater system and then a high pressure, uh, pressure uh, heater system. And uh, uh, that enhances the efficiency uh, by bleeding steam from the low pressure turb from the high pressure turbine to the high pressure feed water heater. And from the low pressure turbine, you take some steam there and heat the water getting back into the steam generator. So the water in, uh, in the electrical part of the plant does not come into the reactor core in the case of the PWR. In the case of the boiling water reactor, we'll see later, there is no heat exchanger. So the water goes directly into the core of the reactor and uh, steam is generated in the core uh, right there. Uh, the economics of either si uh, uh, system are debated. Here, uh, you need a pressurizer with uh, not shown in the diagram for the pressurized water reactor and you need a steam generator, whereas those two uh, uh, components are not there in the boiling water reactor. Some people argue that's uh, beneficial from the perspective of capital cost, uh, but in fact, they are uh, uh, really uh, very, very similar to uh, each other. And we come to our famous pressurizer here. Uh, how do you pressurize the system? We use electrical heaters. Uh, the operator would push a button, circulate a current in those electrical heaters. Uh, these are uh, covered with water. Uh, the electrical heater heat the water, generates steam that fills up the top of the pressurizer. Uh, the draftsman should have shown a level of water here. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, the pressure increases uh, as a bubble on top of the water that is connected now to the piping, uh, you spread the whole pressure through the uh, piping in the system. So, so you increase the pressure by uh, causing the, uh, the heaters uh, to heat the, the water, produce steam. How do you reduce the pressure? On the top of the pressurizer, you'll find 
uh, a spray nozzle. Uh, if you spray the steam formed on top of the water level, uh, you decrease the pressure. So in that case, you can control the pressure uh, in the reactor. When you start it, you incrementally increase the pressure uh, in uh, the system. Uh, like any pressure equipment uh, in mechanical engineering or chemical engineering, uh, you'll find that you don't allow the pressure in your system to increase beyond a certain limit. Oh, the simple application of it is a pressure cooker. If you have seen one, uh, it gives you a warning. Uh, if you allow the pressure to increase below, beyond its design uh, uh, yield stress, then it will explode we, and we get every once in a while boilers uh, explosions. So in that case, there are safety relief valves. You see here relief nozzle, uh, safety nozzle, six of them. Some of them are PORVs as they are called, power operated relief valves. They automatically open up and then reclose to reduce the pressure if it exceeds the design limit of the piping. And the Three Mile Island accident, uh, uh, something happened there uh, regarding uh, related to the pressurizer is that a, uh, a design flaw, we can call it, or a design failure is that uh, the pressure increased in the system, uh, the safety relief valves opened up, but then they did not recede themselves. The, a valve, a safety relief valve has a stem, uh, it opened up, the steam was released, the pressure decreased, but it does not recede itself. If it didn't recede itself, it means what? It means that the coolant in the system now starts leaking out of the system. And that became a loss of coolant accident and led to the melting of uh, the core. Uh, a design flaw was that uh, the uh, position of the stem was not shown on the control console uh, to the operator. Instead, what he was shown is a light that tells him that the uh, uh, solenoid was energized to get the valve to recede itself, but it did not recede itself. So the pressurizer played a major role in the three mile accent if you read the details of it. Uh, the steam generators, uh, there are two types of steam generators depending on the manufacturer, like whether it's Koshiba Westinghouse or whether it's Babcock and Wilcox. Uh, this is what's called the U-tube design. Why is it called the U-tube? Uh, because the coolant comes in and goes through a bundle of tubes, but they're inverted like a U-tube. So the U-tube goes an inverted U this way. The coolant comes from this side, goes up through it and exits on the other side. Now those U-tubes get the uh, coolant from that goes through the reactor core. And then that is immersed in water uh, the water now is allowed to boil by heat exchange between the, uh, the heat exchanger tubing and the coolant coming from the reactor core. In general, uh, for a turbine, uh, you would like to have dry steam. Dry steam means steam does not, that does not carry droplets of water. Why? The blades of the turbine rotate at their tip at almost the speed of sound. And if you start uh, having droplets of water there, they will erode, literally erode uh, the blades of the turbine. So you send your steam there through dryers. Uh, the dryers uh, 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 subject the outgoing steam to a swirling motion like create a vortex uh, and the centrifugal motion gets the droplets of water to hit the walls and come back uh, into the steam generator. So this is a type of steam generator widely used, but there is another type of steam generator that's called the once through steam generator. So you could see here, it's not a U-tube anymore. The coolant comes from the top. Uh, all the water is turned into steam. Uh, then the steam is superheated and that uh, uh, increases the efficiency uh, of the plant. This is typical of the Babcock's Wilcox company design. So it's called the once through uh, steam generator. Uh, the reactor coolant pumps uh, are marvels of technology. Uh, however, uh, if you, uh, they are designed uh, to operate for one phase flow, meaning that they are, they are more efficient at pumping water only, uh, not a mixture of water and steam. So if you have a two phase flow, uh, those pumps start vibrating. And uh, if we read the account of the Three Mile Island accidents, uh, 
because of the depressurization of the system by that uh, uh, release, safety relief valve on top of the pressurizer, uh, the coolant became a mixture of steam and water and pumps are not designed to pump uh, two-phase flow. So they started vibrating and the operators worried about losing their pumps. The, the vibration could cause them to fail. So they shut them off. And as they shut them off, uh, inadvertently, obviously, uh, in that case, they prevented the cooling of the core. Uh, and uh, in that case, the fuel uh, and the cladding melted in the Three Mile Island accident in general. Uh, so this is a design used in the United States, uh, but the Russians have a similar design. They call it the Vodo Vodiano, uh, uh, Vodo Vodianoi Energetsky reactor and the abbreviation for it is a VVER. Uh, this is a diagram of uh, that type of a system. Uh, it's no different at all from the American design, except it's a much more elaborate control rod system that comes from the top of the core here. This is the pressure vessel and this is the core at the bottom. So there are different versions uh, depending on the country of the design. Uh, the Russians are acting uh, very aggressively trying to sell their systems. So they have systems sold to Egypt and uh, uh, to Turkey, and uh, they designated as AES 2006 PWR design. You could see here the reactor core, uh, the steam generators and the feed water heaters and the reactor pumps. And this uh, that's another pump here, four pumps, one, two, three, one is not shown. And that would be probably the pressurizer uh, in that case. Uh, this is uh, another diagram of uh, design designed by Russia. Uh, the VBER 300 uh, is contained inside the containment uh, structure that is different than the containment structure designs uh, used by the United States, Japan, and uh, uh, the European countries. Uh, so this is a another version. They call it the VV. ER 400 model V230. Uh, definitely, it is a pressurized water reactor. As you could see, the core is here. The control rods come from the top, two steam generators. Then the steam is produced, taken to a turbine, to an electrical uh, generator. So the water is not allowed to boil inside the core. What's not? Oh, they are showing even the pressurizer on the top right there. Uh, pressurized water reactors. Uh, uh, are, uh, they, of course, uh, have to be protected from the environment. So they are in place inside the containment structure. Uh, that containment structure, if you notice, is primarily uh, concrete, reinforced concrete. However, it is, uh, it is misnamed. They call it the containment system. But the real containment system is a steel shell shown here. Do you see here that it says steam liner? Uh, that surrounds really the whole reactor system. That concrete structure on the outside is meant to protect the plant personnel from any gamma radiation produced by the reactor core, uh, as well as protecting the internals against any outside events like uh, uh, hurricane. Uh, uh, for instance, you can, it is in fact designed to take uh, uh, the, an impact from 100 miles per hour uh, light pole hitting it. Uh, it is designed to take a direct impact from uh, a Boeing 747 uh, airplane. The real containment structure is that steel shell here uh, with all the engineer safety fe features that we covered in the previous chapter. For instance, you have the accumulator tanks at the bottom here and excess supply of water should the coolant be lost by a pipe breaking, say, in an earthquake. Uh, the reactor vessel is here the steam generator are there. And if there is any leak in the piping, you'll find that we have a containment spray. Uh, if steam is generated, uh, sooner or later, uh, if you do not quench the steam, uh, the pressure is going to affect the weakest link. And the weakest link, not shown in that diagram, is a piping for instrumentation that comes in and out, and uh, they coolant in and out. So in that case, uh, this uh, containment if radioactivity is released in the case of an accident, if you do not spray uh, uh, and condense the steams, sooner or later the radioactivity is going to lead to uh, the environment. That's an accident situation. Uh, 
Uh, for that reason, there is another type of a containment structure that's called uh, the ice condenser uh, containment. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, you uh, uh, build up a refrigerator inside the containment. Remember, the containment is all the components, the uh, the control rods, uh, high pressure coolant pumps, uh, high pressure, uh, low pressure coolant pumps, uh, accumulator tanks, refueling uh, water storage tank. This is what we is really the containment, uh, not the structure itself. But there, uh, in that other containment design, uh, you have a refrigeration system, and uh, you produce literally ice. And the ice there, instead of having a spray of the containment, would uh, condense any steam in the case of an accident. Obviously, it's very costly to keep that ice uh, in the ice uh, mode without its uh, melting. So this is the uh, pressurized water reactor ice containment design. Notice again the steel shell and what it contains is really where steam is contained in the case of an accident. The outside is a biological shield. They call it the concrete shield building and uh, it's meant to protect the internals of the reactor itself. Shown here is the reactor core, the control rod drive, the steam generators, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, equipment. This is the control rod uh, uh, drive uh, sh missile shield. It's uh, protecting it. And then you have a hoist at the top of the structure uh, that uh, would uh, put out the lid from the top of the reactor. Uh, and then uh, remove the lid uh, with the control, uh, place it on that level there and bring in new fuel and extract used fuel from the system. And the whole system design is uh, some kind of comp the components complement each other in a very, very intricate way. Uh, newer designs uh, on the drawing board. Uh, this is the what's designated as advanced uh, uh, pressurized water reactor. Now, this reactor tries to use the economies of scale. So they have a capacity of 1700 megawatt electric. Notice here I'm making a differentiation between megawatt electric and megawatt thermal. Uh, if the efficiency, say, is uh, uh, one third, then uh, the thermal power would be three times that amount. So let's say 5000 megawatt thermal. Uh, this uh, design is advocated as the largest uh, pressurized water reactor of its class. You notice it is one, two, three, four uh, steam generators uh, to produce uh, a power of 1700 megawatt electric. Typically, uh, existing uh, power plants uh, are in the range of the 900 to 1000 megawatt electric. For instance, our uh, Clinton plant uh, west of town has a, cap uh, has a capacity of 910 it started as 900, then it became 910 by improving the steam generators. Uh, the, uh, this would be the nuclear island, as it's called. Next to it, you would have a, uh, 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 the turbine uh, or the electrical island, where you have now the steam going to the steam generators and the condenser. A good practice in the design of nuclear power plants is to have the rotation of the turbine blades because they can get ejected as an accident. Uh, if they rotate in this way, uh, they would be ejected away from the structure of the plant. Unfortunately, that's not the case for the uh, first picture in the design. You'll find that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the turbine hull uh, is some kind in the wrong direction, but that's was probably an architectural uh, problem for the civil engineers. Uh, existing reactors as an old generation that operated uh, uh, for 20 years, then they're uh, surveyed for their safety. They can get another 20 year operation license. And some of them are even applying for a 60 year operation license after a safety survey. Uh, however, the trend is to design uh, more sa uh, safer reactors than what we have today. And uh, in that case, you find that uh, in the United States, uh, two designs have been licensed, uh, and that's called the Advanced Passive AP-1000. That would be 1,000 megawatt electric. Uh, it's a design uh, both by Toshiba in Japan and its subsidiary Westinghouse here uh, in the United States. 
there is also an AP600, which would be 600 megawatt electric that has been uh, licensed. Uh, typical of that design that is being constructed, in fact, now they don't build the older uh, designs, is a typical chimney here. So what does that chimney mean? Uh, if you have a release of steam inside the containment structure, uh, sooner or later, if you don't cool it, it is going to uh, break through the weakest link, which is the penetrations for the coolant uh, inlet and exit uh, and the, the coolant inlet and the exit of the steam, as well as the instrumentation uh, uh, tubing coming in and out. So the steel shell, as I suggested, that is really the containment uh, needs to be cooled. And uh, in that design, uh, uh, the steel shell shown here, follow the arrow here, is surrounded by the concrete shell, but in between them, they leave a space that is open to the environment. So it's fine that uh, in that case, if there is steam released inside the containment of the reactor, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the concrete shield does not act as an insulator uh, air comes in from the top here, these openings at the top, they go down and then rise through the chimney to cool the reactor. Now, why does that happen? Because that top there contains a supply of water here. You could see here a uh, uh, water tank and that water tank would spray the water on top of the steel shell. So that would cool the reactor and prevent it uh, from uh, really uh, the steam from leaking. The steam uh, would leak uh, in that case mixed with radioactivity. So in that case, you prevent radioactivity from spreading into the environment. So the advanced passive reactors are now the reactors that are under construction uh, in Finland, uh, the United States uh, and other countries. Uh, the French uh, have their own typical interesting design. It's still a pressurized water reactor, but they call it uh, the EPR. They give it a different name. Uh, and the EPR stands for uh, uh, Evolutionary uh, Power Reactor or Pressurized Water Reactor. In fact, people like to uh, explain the acronym in a different way. They call it the European Power Reactor because it's being built in Finland uh, and uh, by Electricité de France in uh, in France. Uh, what's typical of that reactor is the way they treat the possibility of the core melting down. That happened in Fukushima. Uh, it didn't uh, happen, uh, uh, well, the core melted down in the Three Mile Island, but it did not exit the pressure vessel. But in the case of the uh, uh, meltdowns in Japan, Fukushima, the core melted down and went out of the pressure vessel. So they provide uh, in that eventuality, a, a pool outside the reactor containment shown here, where that melted core would spread itself over a large surface, and in that case would undergo some convective cooling to the environment, so that uh, in that case uh, simply doesn't go through uh, the bottom of uh, the core and get embedded into the concrete or into the rock structure uh, under the reactor. What people like to call the China syndrome. They made a movie about it. It's totally uh, fictitious because uh, that pool of molted uh, core, if it melts, will go just a few meters into the ground at most 10 meters. Uh, it will not keep going into uh, China. It will, if it ever gets to the center of the earth, it's molten steel anyway, iron and nickel, uh, uh, and it will stay there. It's totally fictitious, the depth at which a, a molten core would go would be 10 meters, but it is still a mess. So they control it by having it spread into a pool where it can cool itself and then uh, be disposed of. So that's typical of that uh, EPR, the European Pressurized Water Reactor or the uh, Evolutionary Power Reactor. Uh, every design, on uh, every country in the world comes out there, their own names for the designs. Uh, there is the Advanced uh, Pressurized Reactor 1400. Uh, this is an effort by uh, South Korea. So they also manufacture reactors and they found a good market in the United Arab Emirates. They sold four units there uh, to a country that produces primarily oil and natural gas, but they're looking into the future where the value 
of hydrocarbons would be for transportation and for chemical stocks. And uh, in that case, uh, nuclear energy uh, would be more suitable for electricity and hopefully for the salting sea uh, water. You could see here their design again. Uh, uh, they have uh, 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 safety features that exceed the, the ones in other designs. And of course, it's industrial competition between Russia, the United States, and Japan, and uh, South Korea in uh, building uh, reactors uh, in general. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Arriva, which is uh, uh, the French company, uh, in collaboration with, with Mitsubishi from Japan, came out with the AGMEA1, uh, a very uh, complex design. Mitsubishi likes to go for uh, large reactor uh, capacities. Uh, they are using the uh, basically the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, when you go to larger power, uh, you have a, 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 some kind of a, a lower cost for, for the production of electricity. However, uh, utilities after the 1980s uh, uh, financial crisis cannot find nine, uh, 4 billion uh, uh, per unit that if you buy it from South Korea or 9 billion per thousand megawatt unit if you buy it in the United States, uh, the capital is not available. So the trend is really towards smaller reactors. However, there is an economy of scale. The economy of scale is that when you go to higher powers, uh, the uh, cost of electricity uh, decreases. So that at MIA 1, a PWR design is a collaboration between Arriva in France and Japan's Mitsubishi. Now, France, as you know, produces 70% uh, of its electricity from nuclear power. They don't have a good supply of fossil fuels uh, like the United States. We have lots of oil and uh, uh, coal. Uh, Iris is an interesting design that has been developed by the General Electric Company. It takes ideas from naval reactors. And this is what's called an integral reactor. Since uh, the worry in existing uh, PWRs is that an earthquake will break the piping, causing to depressurization and the loss of the coolant, they say, OK, let us place the reactor and the steam generator inside the same pressure vessel. So in that case, if any leaks happen in the, in the piping, the, uh, the, it will be contained within the pressure vessel uh, itself. So the core would be there at the bottom, as you could see, core. And then if you go on the top here, you'll find that you have a pressurizer on the top, as well as a uh, the steam generator here, steam generator outlet nozzle, eight of uh, nozzles. So the steam generator and the uh, core of the reactor are in place inside the same design, uh, same uh, uh, pressure uh, vessel in general. So here uh, is uh, uh, a description of the existing uh, and the future uh, designs of uh, pressurized water reactors. That has to be compared to the boiling water reactor. And uh, both of them use light water. So they're designated as LWRs, light water reactors. And this is an interesting picture uh, of the Clinton power plant west of town. Uh, you could see here, uh, it's a well-designed system because you find the containment structure here and then the uh, turbine hall uh, is designed in such a way if a blade uh, uh, is uh, ejected from one of the turbines, it won't hit, hit uh, the reactor building itself, the uh, containment structure. Uh, the site was designed to have two units, but only one unit was constructed. And as you could see here, a reflection of the lights and of the moon, uh, it is cooled by a cooling lake. And uh, uh, the lake uh, was not supposed to be opened for uh, recreation, but it is uh, uh, now a, a destination for boating and fishing and uh, water skiing. Uh, it's not, and then people also went and built mansions that have a lake view around the lake when it's all supposed to be uh, more like an industrial lake, not a recreational lake. Uh, another way of cooling a uh, nuclear, uh, so that the lake is artificial, it was not, it is, was not a, a natural lake. Uh, another way of cooling the power plants is the use of cooling towers. And uh, those cooling towers will get a supply of water from 
a stream, a lake maybe, or a river, and uh, uh, simply generate an artificial rain inside the cooling tower. They take, they're open at the bottom, and uh, as uh, the air circulates, you create a, an artificial rain of hot water. So the surface of it, through adiabatic cooling, generates steam, and the steam is released. That is not steam ever that went ever into the core of the reactor. So it's not radioactive, as some people think. Uh, the reactor buildings would be those uh, 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 structures here. So in that case, uh, uh, the heating of the water, say, in Clinton Lake is replaced by some of the water that would be evaporated from a lake, and uh, uh, no water goes through the reactor core itself. At the bottom of one of these, you could see that's open. Uh, it's a large structure. Look at the height of the fence here. And if you go inside it and look up, uh, this is what you see. This gentleman here is taking a picture of the top of the dome. The shape of it encourages natural circulation or natural convection. So the uh, artificial rain is generated. The water is collected there at the bottom after the artificial rain would have cooled the, uh, the, the coolant and rejected heat to the environment in general. Uh, boiling water reactors have undergone lots of lots and uh, uh, different uh, evolution and uh, modifications. The first designs were designated as BWR1 and BWR2. Uh, they used uh, basically, uh, uh, one of them is in Illinois, the Dresden 1 uh, unit, uh, BWR2. Uh, is a unit designated at Oyster Creek. Uh, bo boiling water three and four is another unit dressed in two that was here in Illinois. It has been retired. The Brown Ferry uh, design had an interesting accident in that uh, uh, there was a fire by uh, some uh, negligent uh, uh, people looking for any leaks uh, inside the uh, in the insulation, and uh, they used <laughs> a, a, a candle. In that case, they ignited the insulation, and there was a fire there. BWR5, in, also we have a unit in Illinois, La Salle uh, plant. If you visit the, um, uh, uh, the it's, it's a boiling water reactor, obviously, uh, by the city, uh, uh, city of La Salle by, uh, uh, in Illinois. We took our class once for a visit to that plant. Uh, then uh, from BWR 1, 2, 3, 4, we have 6 now. Uh, they have improved the jet, uh, they replaced uh, the jet pumps that caused trouble. Uh, and that is basically the design uh, right next to us here at the Clinton plant. Uh, so the, the Clinton plant is the latest uh, operating design of the BWR. However, uh, new designs are being suggested. The advanced boiling water reactor uh, these three have been built in Japan, and the economic small boiling water reactor uh, has been also suggested by the General Electric Company. And in that case, uh, uh, it uh, does not use pumps at all. It uses a chimney effect uh, along a high structure where the natural convection by the heated water inside the core rises and then falls down after it's cooled and the circulation does not depend on uh, pumps. So that's a very neat design and it lends itself to small size reactors uh, in general. Uh, this is typical uh, design of a power cycle of a boiling water plant. Notice we don't have the pressurizer. We do not have the steam generators because the water boils inside the core. Uh, however, you have now steam drying equipment near the top. So typical of boiling water reactor is that the control rods, CRD here, come in from the bottom. And that's a vulnerability because the plants at Fukushima uh, had uh, control rods from the bottom and the core melted and went through uh, the seals of the control rods and uh, came out of the, uh, from the bottom of the pressure vessel. A uh, typical of boiling water reactors also is the existence of what they call the suppression, pressure suppression pool. And that pool is there so that if there is any leakage of steam from the piping, it would be quenched by uh, boiling it, you could see here, or uh, uh, inside the, the water. Uh, however, uh, uh, 
that's a bad design shown in the diagram because if the core melts, goes through the control rod drives, it will fall into the water. And if it falls in the water, you get what's called a steam explosion, a very uh, strong chemical type of release of energy. And unfortunately, uh, that mistake in the design was uh, the case in the Chernobyl accident. They had their pressure suppression pour right under the core. They thought that that core could never melt, but it did melt. And then the metal from uh, the core, like in Fukushima also somehow interacted with the water uh, existing under the core and led to a possible steam explosion. All right, so the steam is generated inside the core. Uh, that's uh, pressure uh, uh, and uh, taken to a high pressure turbine uh, with a moisture separator to low pressure turbine, so electrical generator and attached to the grid. Uh, the water from the uh, uh, from the <clears throat> turbines is condensed in the condenser and taken back into the core. And because the water goes into the core uh, that goes also through the turbine plant, the chemical engineers here are very much needed. Uh, you have to, uh, in the low pressure uh, feed water heaters, you have to provide a chemical treatment of the water to make it very clean, otherwise, uh, the system would uh, corrode, not only corrode, but there will be pockets of, uh, say, rust uh, or radioactive isotopes that would be radioactive in different parts of the plant itself. Boiling water reactors, as we'll see at the end of the chapter, are typically also producers of an isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 16, from the isotopes of oxygen in the water, and that emits gamma radiation. So when you produce a steam uh, for a, a, a boiling water reactor, you take it through piping to the top of the containment structure all the way to the bottom and then back again, not shown in that diagram, to the uh, uh, turbine plant uh, to give it a chance to decay. It has a very short half-life, about 16 seconds. So it is discouraged for boiling water reactors to have the staff access the electrical part of the plant. Uh, and uh, uh, but once the plant is uh, the reactor is shut down, uh, they can access it for maintenance within maybe a few minutes. Uh, the uh, engineer safety features, as we suggested, uh, are the control rods. Uh, some people suggest that they come from the bottom, not because of the drying equipment at the top, but because also the power level in the reactor since there are no voids near the bottom, uh, is higher, so you bring in the control where your power level is high. But uh, that's complementary to the fact that you need uh, room for the drying equipment. Uh, you, you give the steam a swirling motion or uh, a rotating motion, so the droplets of water are uh, dropped back into the core and the steam goes dry uh, into the turbine. But notice here the low pressure coolant injection system, the high pressure coolant injection system, and uh, the reactor, the uh, decay heat uh, uh, system. And another engineer safety feature that we mentioned for the boiling water reactor is a condensate storage tank. In the PWR, two extra sources of water are the accumulator tanks and the re refueling water storage tank. BWR, it's a condensate uh, storage tank for uh, plants that are built uh, uh, not uh, not really on submar uh, submarines use PWRs, not uh, BWRs. Uh, this is a cutout uh, uh, from the uh, the uh, safety uh, report, the environmental safety report of the one of the designs at Fukushima, and you could see they have what's called the light bulb design for the. Uh, the containment structure. This is a pressure suppression pool. It's in the shape of a big torus containing uh, water. Uh, the interaction between the melted core and water was from water here uh, uh, with water that accumulated in what's called supposedly the dry well, but it wasn't dry. So there is a suspected steam explosion that happened there. But notice something very interesting there. You find that lots of the safety equipment in that type of a design never uh, thought about a uh, flooding accident. 
Uh, however, uh, in that plant at Fukushima uh, in particular, this is the grid level. You could see here the grid level made the ground level. So when the, the Fukushima, uh, at Fukushima, the uh, tsunami wave came in above that ground level and flooded the basement where they had lots of the safety equipment. So that was a station blackout situation as it's called. The plant itself does not produce steam anymore. It doesn't produce electricity and it cannot import electricity from the grid. All power plants are connected to the grid uh, to import electricity for their instrumentation. So the plant became doubly blind and uh, station blackout is when the plant stops producing electricity and uh, uh, also doesn't have access to the grid. Uh, the uh, grid uh, connection to the plant was from a switch yard or a transformer station eight kilometers from the plant. I followed the power lines once on Google Maps, uh, eight kilometers away from the plant and the earthquake had uh, damaged it. So uh, uh, it, uh, Fukushima became one new type of an accident in which you are flooding the safety equipment and the batteries bank. So the control room itself became dark. Uh, they had uh, no control on the evolution of uh, the accident. That shows us here the battery banks that were uh, uh, supposed to be safety uh, equipment. Uh, but uh, again, the grade level was such that uh, the safety equipment was flooded and it the designed what was called before a station blackout, but now it's also a flooding accident. So the pressure suppression pool is the body of water in which if any break in the piping inside the containment structure is quenched by bubbling it in uh, the water. Uh, however, that design is not an optimal design uh, because it does not allow the operators to use uh, natural convection. A better placement for that supply of water is to place it above the reactor core. So in that case, if you connect the coolant in the core to that uh, pressure suppression pool, uh, the hot water will rise and then it will come down and provide natural circulation, even if you don't have electricity uh, to run the pumps that supposedly uh, would cool the system in the case of an accident. Uh, to make the point about the Fukushima plant, this is the bottom of the pressure vessel here. This is the reactor vessel. This is how the control rods come into the core of the reactor. And you find here that seal here. Uh, that seal is a graphite seal that prevents the water from the core uh, uh, from leaking outside the control rod. In the accident at Fukushima, uh, those uh, inlets for the control rods at the bottom basically the temperature of the uh, molten core uh, probably uh, affected that seal is graphite. It can take a high temperature, but uh, it found its way out of the core uh, and then uh, susp a suspicion of a steam explosion uh, happened uh, in that case. Uh, the uh, control rods uh, on boi most boiling water reactors are driven by the pressure of the coolant in the reactor itself. So you could see here, this is the existing design. RPV stands for reactor pressure vessel, control rods coming in from the bottom and using the pressure in the core. What if the pressure in the core is depressurized? Uh oh, that's a problem. So the Tokyo uh, 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 Electrical Power Company have replaced uh, in some of their reactors, the control rods driven by the pressure of the coolant, a hydraulic pressure, by electrical system where you have a, an induction motor here, the coils are shown, that rotates a screw basically that raises and lowers the control rods. So, uh, and that's basically an electrical system rather than a hydraulic system to control uh, the in uh, and out motion of the control rods. What are those control rods? Uh, this is a picture, an actual picture of those control rods being maintained by some engineer there. Uh, they are in the form of a cross. You see the cross here. That cross shape takes, contains lots of uh, tubes and those tubes contain a neutron absorbing material like indium or, uh, or boron. And as you can see here, they come in also from the bottom of the core. And uh, because the reaction between the neutrons 
and the absorbing material generates heat, they have to be uh, uh, cooled. So uh, those holes in uh, the blades here are for cooling the uh, control rods. And uh, the control rods are inserted uh, uh, in a gap, the cross gap in between four uh, fuel uh, channels uh, containing long tubes, same as a PWR containing a ceramic uh, so, that, that it can so that it can take a high temperature uh, made out of uranium dioxide in that case. So you have uh, each one of those channels here with a single control. Four, every four channels have a single uh, control rods coming in uh, in between them. And uh, when you put that whole thing together, this would be uh, uh, the shape of the BWR6 design. That's the latest BWR design because before the uh, advanced boiling water reactor. And uh, you could see there that you have the core here and uh, uh, the core uh, has the control rods coming from the bottom uh, in the pressure vessel and lots of room there is taken by the drying equipment inside the pressure vessel as the steam exits from the top and the coolant in the core itself, around the core itself, uh, is driven by what's called jet pumps. Uh, you cannot have uh, uh, electrical pumps inside the pressure vessel, so jet pumps are used. Jet pumps are very familiar uh, in the countryside where farmers use them uh, for pumping water from their uh, wells. Uh, they had problems with, it, with them so that they have been replaced now by what's called hand rotor uh, pumps. Uh, this is a steel shell, again, containment. I argue that the real containment, you see this is a correct diagram. The real containment is a steel shell surrounding the core and the other safety equipment. This is also a good design. The water suppression pool uh, is away. We have a dry well here right under the control rods. In Fukushima, that wasn't the case. I'll show you later. And uh, uh, in that uh, type of a design, uh, the containment really is a steel shell and the other safety equipment. The shield building is a shield against radiation as well as uh, any effects from the outside elements affecting uh, the core. Oh, we had the tech specs for the pressurized water reactor. And these are the tech specs for the boiling water reactor so that we can compare them. For the same almost uh, megawatt thermal uh, energy produced, you find that the pressure is in the BWR is one half uh, the one used in the uh, PWR. So it was 2200 PSI absolute pounds per square inch absolute for the PWR. Here it's only 1000 PSI. The enrichment is not that much different from 2.2 to 2.7 percent in uranium 235. And we'll have a whole chapter on how to increase the enrichment of the uranium 235 in the fuel uh, uh, from the 0.72% that occurs uh, in nature. In terms of coolant flow and temperatures, they are uh, at the same uh, level, so we are not going to dwell on this uh, for too long. Here is a picture, uh, a diagram of the fuel assemblies. Uh, you'll find that the little uh, uh, pellets are made out of uh, uranium dioxide that enclosed in the can or in a clad. On top of it, you have a spring to keep those little pellets one centimeter almost in uh, uh, diameter uh, close to each other. A, a filling gap uh, is filled with helium and you have basically an array of those fuel elements with spacers in between them so that they don't vibrate when the coolant comes from the bottom and exits from the top extracting the energy from their surface. So the jet pumps have been basically uh, a, a way of circulating the coolant inside the core. And they are positioned, as you could see here, around the periphery of the core. Usually there are 16 of those jet pumps around the core. You don't want something uh, like uh, an actual pump that bring, uh, needs electricity uh, or needs uh, uh, lubrication for uh, or replacement of the seals. So the jet pumps are used inside uh, the core of the reactor up to the existing uh, designs. Uh, and this is the structure of those jet pumps, 16 of them around the periphery of the core. And usually there are two pumps together. 
and then you bring in a flow and uh, use a nozzle inject that flow from the outside. So the pumps are driven from the outside of the pressure vessel, but then the flow itself uh, as a nozzle is moving inside uh, the reactor uh, pressure vessel itself. And the way it's uh, operated and why they call it a jet pump is that you would have that nozzle or a diffuser here and uh, you bring in a driving flow. And if you inject the water there at high pressure and you have an opening there on top, it creates suction. Suction means that the pressure decreases and uh, uh, basically circulates the water inside the pressure vessel without having the pump itself inside the vessel. So this would be the two diffusers or two nozzles. There have been problems with those pumps. So uh, they have been replaced now in the latest designs with what's called the canned rotor pumps. Uh, the flow process, uh, of course, shows us pumps here inside the pressure vessel circulating the coolant. Uh, one typical uh, feature of boiling water reactors that we mentioned is the existence of uh, uh, core sprays. So if the temperature in the core increases, the suggestion is that you can bring some water from the uh, uh, pressure suppression pool maybe and uh, spray the core uh, to cool it. Well, that's uh, questionable really, because uh, if you, the core is hot and you spray it with water, you generate steam. And as you generate steam, uh, that you heat up the metal, the cladding, and in that case, the steam can interact with the metal, uh, H2O uh, uh, plus the metal. Uh, you'll find that you oxidize the metal, so it becomes maybe zirconium oxide, and oh, hydrogen is released, and then you end up with those hydrogen explosions that happened at Fukushima. So that uh, uh, core uh, spray is questionable. Uh, if it is operated at low temperatures, it will work, obviously. But if the temperature is too high, uh, then it becomes a hydrogen producer, which is not a very nice feature. So that has to be looked upon. So compared to the flow diagram for a PWR, here is a flow diagram for a typical boiling water reactor. No pressurizer, no steam generator. Uh, the uh, the the energy is produced inside the core, inside the pressure vessel. The control rods come in from the bottom and the rest is the same. Uh, the steam is taken to a high pressure turbine, to a low pressure turbine. Along the same axis, you have the electrical generator. Then you bleed steam to a high pressure uh, feed water heater and to a low pressure feed water heater. The rest of the steam is taken to a condenser and uh, the condensed flow now uh, goes back into the core. As I said, uh, it needs more attention to the water that comes uh, into the core. So you must have uh, basically a clean up the mineralizing system and you have to manage the chemistry of the water because if you have oxygen available in it, you need the corrosion and then that corrosion will accumulate in the piping and become a source of radiation for the personnel. Another safety feature, of course, is a condensate storage tank that we said is typical of boiling water reactors. Well, this is a one design that's called the pressure uh, vessel design. You could see here that the core is contained inside a pressure vessel, but the Russians came in uh, uh, and uh, at the time of the Soviet Union and built in the Ukraine, which is an independent republic now, uh, the uh, RBMK type of designs. Uh, they differ from the existing designs of the boiling water reactor in a vessel by having hundreds of tubes shown here. Uh, this is from a diagram from a Russian publication. And uh, uh, those hundreds of tubes now are uh, encased into graphite. So graphite becomes the moderator. Then they bring in water as a coolant. They have one pump here, one pump here. Uh, the water goes through the tubes but they, the water in that case is not acting as a moderator. It's just acting as a poison. It absorbs the neutrons. Uh, the water is allowed to boil in the tubes. Uh, it goes like conventional power plants into uh, two uh, drums. They're called the steam drums. Uh, the water settles at the bottom. The steam goes to the top and is sent to the uh, turbine plant. 
uh, the design there is meant to be used as a dual purpose. So they have a lid on top of the reactor and they have been a hoist or a winch on top of it that can access the core even when the reactor is running. And notice the control rods again coming here from the bottom. Uh, the RBMK-1000, the uh, Chernobyl design was meant to be a dual purpose type of a reactor in the sense that it produced electricity through but it was also meant to be used to produce plutonium uh, in a situation that is strategic. There is a war, for instance, and uh, the typical aspect of weapons-grade plutonium is that you do not irradiate it uh, for a whole year or two years. You form the isotope 240, plutonium 240, which is unsuitable for making any kind of uh, weapon device. In fact, in, instead, you irradiate uh, uranium-238 for a very short period of time, no more than two weeks, uh, extract the plutonium-239 from it, and then uh, don't leave it there uh, any uh, longer. So uh, it was meant as a dual purpose plan. So in that case, it had online access, and this is an actual picture inside an RBMK-1 uh, Southern design. It's well designed, from the perspective that uh, you could walk on top of the core here uh, while it is in operation. And these are all the channels uh, in the large uh, bay where the uh, access to the core from the top was done. Uh, the uh, uh, boiling water reactor six, which has been the latest design is being superseded now by what is called the advanced boiling water reactor. And this is a design advanced by the general electric company. They show that design here, the advanced boiling water reactor. Notice that if you look at the legend that the uh, emergency diesel generators are up uh, on a high level inside the plant. Uh, some people in the Fukushima accident said, oh, uh, they were at the grid level, they were affected by the uh, tsunami water. They mistook the emergency diesel generators for the emergency core cooling system that we mentioned in the engineer safety features with the transformers. These are transformers outside the plant. However, even in that design, the advanced boiling water reactor, you'll find those turbines here at the top, which are really safety equipment. And these are still in that design below grade. Do you see the grade going in here? So in the Fukushima design uh, accident, uh, that if, if they had that uh, particular design, uh, that safety equipment and batteries would have been flooded and basically the, uh, the, uh, the station blackout uh, uh, would occur. Uh, the earthquake would kill electricity from outside the plant, outside source, as well as the electricity produced by the plant uh, itself. So that safety equipment should be like the diesel generators move from the bottom there to the top or the whole plant uh, must not have a basement basically. Uh, where you have safety equipment. Uh, you have to put there some equipment that is not, uh, 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 if you are uh, close to uh, a river or a lake or an ocean, uh, it should not be below, be below grade. Uh, the turbine design is a correct design here. You could see that the turbines in their rotation, if there is an ejection of a blade, it won't hit the containment structure here on that side. Uh, and. Uh, uh, unlike the PWR that I've shown in the previous lecture uh, that was not designed properly. So now look here, uh, there are no jet pumps anymore in the advanced boiling water reactor. So they eliminated the problems, mechanical problems that occurred and you get what are called uh, basically pumps that come in from the bottom. Uh, they are called canned rotor pumps. And uh, uh, this is uh, basically an adoption from the naval technology. Uh, existing reactors uh, on land have gone through uh, evolution or development of four generations. Whereas naval reactors for propulsion of submarines and, uh, uh, and aircraft carriers have gone through nine generations. So they have much more advanced features just coming out from the evolution of the new technologies uh, uh, involved. So this is uh, a, uh, it shows us the diagram of an advanced boiling water reactor. Uh, notice again that the control rods come in from the top. These are the canned rotor pumps replacing the jet pumps. 
uh, abo above uh, the level of the reactor, they have a fuel pool where the spent fuel is stored there temporarily until the re radioactivity goes down and it's available for reprocessing or remanufacturing the whole process. And so this is the shape or the design of those canned rotor pumps uh, for the advanced boiling water reactor. It's not the jet pumps anymore. Uh, the pump rotates on the outside and the impellers of the pump are inside uh, the pressure uh, vessel. They come in from the bottom uh, again, which is a variability in the case of uh, melting uh, of the core. Uh, an interesting design is ESBR now uh, on the drawing board. Uh, they like to call the economical small boiling water reactor, ESBWR. Uh, the trend again among the utilities, if they start building nuclear power plants in the United States, there are only two units being uh, produced uh, or built today, uh, is that uh, 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 it doesn't have, it doesn't need any pumps. It is dependent on the uh, natural convection from the core where the water is heated, so its density decreases, it rises at the top, as it cools down, it comes down, and uh, so it, uh, it's station blackout cannot occur in the sense that uh, the system will cool itself by itself. It doesn't need electricity to drive the pump that cool it. The electrical power uh, is 50, uh, the uh, 1500 megawatt electric, which is quite, quite high, I think, uh, a design at the range of 500 would be uh, more accessible to uh, utilities that need uh, a capital. But the interesting aspect of it in the economical small reactor is that uh, they basically responded uh, to engineers telling them that pressure suppression pool should not be at the bottom of the core. So they bring it there. Actually, it's uh, at the top. It should be brought even higher. Uh, that was an idea by a design uh, group of students uh, here from Illinois who went to work for the General Electric Company. <clears throat> so here is the uh, ESBWR pressure vessel. No pumps, just a lot, tall vessel uh, where the uh, buoyancy of the water being heated, the density decreases, it goes up, the, uh, goes up here and then comes down and circulates. The control rods are still from the bottom all the drying equipment at the top to dry the steam increase its quality uh, and uh, send it to the turbine without the water droplets that would uh, uh, erode the turbine blades. So the ESBWR, I think, uh, as a small unit is a wave of the future. Uh, it has an automatic depressurization system. It has a gravity-driven cooling system. That's the most important part. What they say, gravity-driven cooling system, that is natural circulation. Uh, it has an isolation condenser system. Uh, all these are no safety features, a passive containment cooling system. And uh, it's shown right here now, uh, where basically uh, they still call it a suppression pool. But in fact, that suppression pool, the whole pool should be brought right there on the top. These are they're still showing the fuel storage tank there. And the pressure suppression pool should be brought to the top and it's a good design from the perspective is that there is no water under it uh, like in the Chernobyl type of a design where the core melted and interacted with the water. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, BWRs in general that are in operation today have uh, many uh, safety engineer safety features one of them is a depressurization system, uh, you depressurize the reactor so that you can inject water into it at the high flow rate. So this is the, what that's called the isolation, main isolation valves for a typical boiling water reactor, large pieces of equipment. And uh, uh, when I showed you the uh, reactor, I said that there is safety equipment that was below level. Uh, that was uh, the most important one there. Uh, it was uh, uh, a, a turbine that takes steam from the core itself. Uh, in the case of an accident, uh, the turbine takes the steam, rotates, and uses a pump uh, to pump water from the pressure suppression pool or the condensation uh, 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 concentrate storage tank back to cool the reactor core. And that pump was below grade level, so it was uh, flooded. 
uh, and the turbine was flooded. So if you flood uh, any electrical equipment, well, you cannot operate it anymore. You get shorts and electricity and uh, water are not good friends. Uh, for uh, the designs where you produce uh, hydrogen, if you reach very high temperature, I suggested the reaction where steam interacting with any metal. Like if you interact steam, uh, pass it on top of iron that is hot, uh, the iron oxidizes, it takes the oxygen atom from the water and you're left with hydrogen. That's one way of producing hydrogen. So uh, one typical accident, uh, if uh, hydrogen is produced uh, in a nuclear accident, uh, you try to control the release of the uh, hydrogen. If you do not control it, uh, it is explosive and it exploded uh, in three of the units at the Cherno uh, Chernobyl plant uh, because it was not contro controlled. At the uh, Clinton plant, which is a boiling water reactor, the excess steam is simply sparge. Sparge meaning that uh, you simply bubble it under water and on the surface of the water, you start a spark plug like in the engine of a car uh, for control burning of the hydrogen. Nevertheless, in the Three Mile Island accident, there is a suspicion that uh, a hydrogen explosion uh, did happen to a certain extent. Uh, to get uh, power to the control room in the case of uh, a station blackout where the plant is not producing electricity and its connection to the grid also uh, is not working, uh, you get, uh, you have uh, banks of uh, batteries uh, to provide at least electricity to the control room. Uh, in the Chernobyl accident, those batteries were immersed underwater. They were flooded, so they were not available to run the plant. So the, uh, the control room literally became dark. And it was heroic, uh, really, uh, effort from the people at the plant to bring in they started trying to bring in batteries from uh, the United States Navy. Uh, their voltage did not match the one used for the control system at the plant. So heroically, they went into their own cars and got batteries, 12 volt batteries from their own cars uh, to provide some form of uh, electricity to the control room so that they can try to control the accident. Typical of boiling water reactors, I suggest is, is the nitrogen 16 isotope formation. Uh, because the water coolant goes into the core of the reactor, you'll find that the oxygen-16 isotope interacts with neutrons, uh, produces nitrogen-16. And uh, nitrogen-16 has a half-life of 7 seconds, 7.1 seconds. And the uh, natural abundance of uh, oxygen-16, uh, of course, is most of the oxygen in water, 99.758%. So, but uh, because it is radioactive, uh, you'll find that the steam uh, coming out from the boiling water reactor would contain that nitrogen 16 and is basically uh, uh, radioactive. So you try to uh, control that problem by getting the piping containing the steam to go to the top of the building, to the bottom of the building before it reaches the turpentine plant. It gives it time to decay. And uh, within uh, maybe a few minutes uh, after shutting down the plant, because the nitrogen 16 decays so rapidly, uh, you do not uh, need, uh, uh, <clears throat> you can have access for maintenance uh, of the plant itself. I write the rate equations in case you need to design such a system for uh, in the future. And uh, the radiation also accumulates in the system. So I solve here the rate equations if you need them. Uh, in any design in your future. And the, includes a production rate and the uh, residual activity, uh, how much uh, the problem would be. Uh, if you uh, circulate the coolant many, many times, you find that the radioactivity accumulates and you can derive the equation for that uh, uh, accumulation of the, uh, and then you can reach equilibrium uh, if you operate the plant for a long time in general. Uh, I show you methods of decreasing that also the radioactivity. So there uh, we cover the pressurized water reactor, the boiling water reactor, and uh, uh, I want you to be aware of the difference between them. Uh, I'll stop here to and go to the chair room uh, in, in case there is uh, 
the chat room in case there are any questions about uh, the two chapters we covered today. Okay, there are no questions, so I'll keep uh, going. Uh, we need to cover as many uh, chapters as we can before the end of the summer here. Uh, the third type of a system that we would be interested in, uh, I'll jump uh, the high uh, temperature gas cooled reactor and go to the heavy water reactor. Uh, the heavy water reactor is an effort that has been undergone by Canada. Remember, we suggested that the PWR and the BWR, because of the presence of neutrons, need the uh, level of the uranium-235 to be enriched from the 0.72% to 3% to 5%. Uh, percent. And uh, the enrichment process needs a tremendous amount of uh, electricity. It's also very sophisticated technology uh, that may not be available to all countries when they want to adopt nuclear power. So in that case, they'd become dependent uh, for their fuel and their electricity on a source of enriched fuel that is only done in the industrialized nations. Uh, Canada uh, came up uh, with the idea that, well, no, we don't want to depend on, say, the Europeans, the Russians, the Japanese, or the Americans to uh, provide us with fuel for our nuclear reactor. So what do we do? Uh, we choose, uh, instead of water that contains hydrogen and oxygen, we use uh, deuterium. And in that case, the uh, de uh, deutrons in the, uh, what is called now heavy water instead of H2O, it's D2O or HDO, uh, that deuterium is, has a better properties in not absorbing neutrons like hydrogen uh, in the water. Uh, so in that case, they had to do some other form of enrichment, the enrichment now of the uh, water in the deuterium isotope. So, uh, and up to a level maybe of 90% H2O or H. HGO or G2O. So it is a, another enrichment process anyway, but it is not as sophisticated and uh, requiring as much electricity as the enrichment of uranium at 235. So the Canadians developed uh, what is called the heavy water reactor. It's a very successful system. Uh, and uh, however, because now uh, they do not enrich the uh, fuel. They do not increase the proportion of uranium-235. Uh, the 0.72% enrichment is very low. So it ends up being used very quickly. And uh, they had to design their system to be online uh, system, meaning that they have to continuously uh, load it with uh, a new uranium and continuously extract the spent fuel out of it. And uh, the Canadians were very successful and they're very proud, in fact, of their designs. Uh, and uh, they have them uh, built uh, primarily in Ontario. And uh, that uh, is right next to the Niagara Falls. They are very successful in providing their country with electricity and the excess. Oh, they sell it to the East Coast in the United States. So they're exporting the uranium, they're expecting, uh, exporting petroleum and they're exporting electricity. And you could see here, they have uh, 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 dedicated this uh, stamp uh, to their first generation Douglas Point uh, plant shown uh, right here. So it's a very successful system for many reasons that I'll describe uh, today. Uh, the heavy water reactor design has evolved to now, uh, this is the, initially it's a complex of reactors, heavy water reactors complex in Canada. As I suggested, uh, uh, if you are going to use heavy water, you have to produce it. So these are towers here, at two plants for the producing of the heavy water. Uh, you get leaks and uh, 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 boiling, maybe some boiling. So in that case, you need to have uh, replace the heavy water as uh, you run a, a Hendo reactor power plant. So this is the initial uh, complex called the Bruce uh, heavy water reactors complex. And uh, this shows us the latest design. It's a second generation Point Le Pro. Uh, and it's run by the Atomic Energy of Canada uh, Limited uh, in that case. Uh, the latest design is what they call the CANDU-6. They even have come up with the CANDU-9. 
Uh, this is an actual picture of the Kendo 6. Uh, they adopt the same design. If you remember in the first chapters, we talked about the light water reactor that were built uh, uh, at Hanford, Washington for producing plutonium from uranium-235. So in that case, they do not have a vertical type of system, but they have a horizontal uh, design. And it's a uh, multiple tubes here and uh, they are cooled and uh, moderated by heavy water, but they can use natural uranium. They don't need to enrich the uranium. However, they have to still enrich the coolant, heavy water, but it's easier and cheaper uh, to produce a heavy water than enriching uh, the uranium and use water. So this is a detail of the diagram. It's a horizontal system. Why horizontal? Because uh, they have to <coughs> they have to run it online. So each tube now will get fed from one side bundles of the natural uranium. If they still use uranium dioxide uh, from one side and then extract it from the other side. All those tubes now contain the fuel. The coolant is heavy water. It goes and cools and pressurizes heavy water. And uh, the whole uh, tank here contains also heavy water for moderating the neutrons. As you could see here, it's a, a plumber's nightmare, all that tubing here. Uh, they also have to use some uh, control rods that come in uh, from the, the control rods come in from the top, uh, in that case vertical, and they use uh, what's called booster rods. So if they shut down the plant and they want to restart it, they need some rods that contain uranium-235 for adding what's called reactivity uh, to the system. One interesting safety feature is that they have uh, that uh, heavy water tank there. If you dump the heavy water out, which is very easy, just open up some kind of a gate, uh, the moderation of the neutron ceases and that shuts down the chain reaction. So they don't need just the control rods. Uh, if you, they, uh, in a safety situation, uh, if they dump the, cool, the moderator coolant, they can shut down the plant. Uh, this is uh, the bundles that they use. These are the fuel pellets inside those clad cans here, and then you get spacers. Each one of these is about 18 inches uh, in length, and they are inserted uh, into the reactor horizontally. So in that case, uh, you have a feeding plant and an extraction plant. So here is the uh, uh, charge machine where you bring those bundles and put them into the tubes and then you have an accept machine once the fuel has been used up uh, in the core you take it out and then go and store it inside a pool and you, uh, uh, before uh, inserting the fuel uh, there is no radioactivity well there is some radioactivity but very minimal so you don't need to cool it but once you extract it you have those fission products that are generating beta particles and the gamma rays. So you have to cool it. You take it into a fuel storage tank and then decide whether to store it outdoors like they do so far or reprocess it like the Europeans and the Russian and the uh, uh, Japanese. Uh, this is a picture of those turbines that we have been talking about. You could see here that the steam comes in near the center here, expands in this direction and expands in the other direction. Otherwise it becomes a rocket. Uh, so the force in this direction and the force in this direction cancel out. Notice that the shaft goes through now the electrical generators right there. So the, uh, the turbine plant and, and, the, and the electrical plant go are connected together. This is from the Douglas Point plant under maintenance. Uh, the description of the uh, uh, operation of the Kendo reactor can be described uh, as uh, uh, in terms of what's called the performance. And the, uh, it has a very high capacity factor because you are using, enrich the, in, uh, inserting the fuel uh, and extracting it online, uh, the plant can run at very high capacity uh, factors. So uh, uh, compared with a pressurized water reactor or boiling water reactor, where you have to shut down the plant uh, to perform maintenance and to refuel it every year or a year and a half. So in terms of life capacity factor, uh, you'll find that uh, it depends on what's called the total 
gross generation figure, how much electricity you generated divided by the typical capacity factor. The capacity factor is the time where the plant is available for producing electricity. And uh, so if you divide those two numbers, multiply it by 100, the unit of the total gross generation is how many megawatt, not is here electric, uh, uh, multiplied by the time in which you have operated it, um, hours, and uh, the capacity factor here, uh, the, it, is it uh, a multiplied capacity factor is CF, and you divide also by the number of hours on which you have uh, uh, the number of hours from the time of first synchronization to the grid of the electricity produced. And you make it a percentage by multiplying by 100. Hours and hours canceled, so the units of the lifetime capacity factor is basically uh, t uh, the units of the TGG here, the, li the uh, total gross generation in megawatt hours multiplied into 100. And uh, we can show this on a graph here. Uh, this is, uh, and that can be translated actually into the levelized uh, unit of electricity cost. Levelized means that you take it over a long period of time, you account for the interest rate and you uh, account for the inflation rate. And uh, the Kendo reactor, as you could see here, uh, uh, the price of electricity, levelized cost of electricity, uh, for the CANDU depends on the, the average capacity factor. So if you have a low capacity factor, you'll find that the electricity from the CANDU reactor is definitely higher than if you use natural gas and definitely higher than if you use coal. However, because the CANDU reactor is operated online and has in fact a high capacity factor in the range of the 90%, actually not just 80%, you find that the CANDU is very competitive in the levelized cost of electricity with coal and natural gas. And that's why the Canadians are very proud of it. And the system is operated in many different countries like Argentina, India, Pakistan, uh, uh, Thailand, countries that do not want to be dependent on other countries to supply them with the enriched fuel because uh, uh, the Providing a country with enriched fuel entails a, uh, a political aspect. So, uh, uh, aspect. so if, uh, say, some conflict arises between political conflict arises, uh, the country providing the enriched fuel can simply deny the other country the enriched fuel and stop its electrical generation. So for countries that do not want to be dependent on other countries for their fuel supply to produce electricity, the CANDU is the best uh, choice. Uh, so far, uh, the fuel that is using CANDU reactors have not been reprocessed or recycled. Uh, lots of uranium is still available in that fuel, lots of plutonium, but in, to use plutonium as a fuel, you need to recycle uh, the fuel. So the Canadians instead are simply leaving it to cool in those silos that are at the site of their power plants. And uh, uh, at some point they will recycle it, I think, and produce what's called the mixed oxide. It's an oxide of plutonium, and, and at the same time also an oxide of uranium. And in that case, they uh, uh, can burn that plutonium that is produced in those reactors. And it is uh, what's called reactor grade plutonium. As I suggested, it contains a large proportion of plutonium, 240, well, that makes that plutonium-239 totally unsuitable for fuel, uh, for making uh, uh, nuclear devices. And I suggested that the RBMK-1000, which is a Chernobyl type of a reactor, was meant to be, in the case of war, uh, produce plutonium-239. Uh, uh, plutonium so it was meant to be dual purpose plant. Hence, uh, they had the uh, access from the top of it uh, uh, through a shielding type of structure. Uh, the waste management, as I said, uh, uh, the fuel is not being reprocessed. Uh, the reactors built in Canada have been very, very successful. Uh, 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 why is it that uh, we don't have them in the United States? Well, for, of course, one, there's a politics involved there, obviously. Uh, the manufacturers in the United States build uh, uh, 
uh, light water reactors uh, like General Electric boiling water reactors as well as Westinghouse, Toshiba uh, build with pressurized water reactors. But uh, there is another consideration though is that the deuterium in the heavy water absorbs a neutron. And as it absorbs a neutron, it becomes tritium. And tritium is a hy uh, hydrogen gas. And hydrogen has a, uh, a property of being a small molecule, so it leaks. So the argument that the uh, candle reactors produce a, an amount of tritium uh, uh, has been used against its implementation and its licensing uh, in the United States. But I think it's a very tiny amount. In fact, the Canadians isolated and then they found a market for it. Uh, the market is used in LCD supplies, liquid crystal displays. Uh, the tritium is used to uh, energize the, 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 the crystals and the salts that give us the colors on our, well, laptop screen. So you have some tritium there in your laptop screen. Uh, if you are watching it on the phone, it's a liquid crystal display. You have some tritium in it too. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, uh, the Canadians have uh, created a market for that very tiny, very tiny amount of tritium. Remember tritium, does not emit gamma rays, it emits only beta particles. So if you have some LCD display on your watch, uh, the backing of the watch is absorbing those electrons. Uh, this is the latest design of uh, the CANDU reactor. They call it the CANDU 9. Again, it's a smart uh, uh, location for the turbine hall. Any uh, ejected blade from the turbines will not hit the power plant uh, when those who put it uh, uh, in, in the perpendicular direction, uh, that would entail a risk uh, in the case of uh, a, a special type of an accident uh, in that case. So today uh, uh, we uh, covered three types of reactors, the three most successful ones, the pressurized water reactor, the boiling water reactor, and the heavy water reactor. Next time we'll go and talk about the high temperature gas cooled reactor. And the high temperature gas cooled reactor obviously operates at high temperature. And high temperature means thermodynamically that it's a higher efficiency. So that's one good reason to use it. But there is another reason to use it uh, and it has to do with people contemplating or having a vision in the future of a transportation system that uses fuel cells. Fuel cells use hydrogen and uh, as uh, in the fuel cell, the hydrogen is uh, combined with oxygen, uh, the product of the combination is steam, water, but at the same time you get a flow of electricity that can drive, in that case, an electrical motor. So uh, hydrogen could be the another alternative to storing energy in batteries. In that case, the hydrogen becomes the battery of the future engines for our transportation system. So before we cover the high temperature gas cooled reactor system, uh, next time we're going to look at uh, how uh, basically uh, to use the uh, how to why is it needed to produce hydrogen and what is a fuel cell and I argue that if we are going to think or be, be uh, envision a transportation system where energy is stored in the form of hydrogen where do you get the hydrogen you dissociate water H2O so it's very abundant and the product of the combustion of the, uh, the fuel cell is water, which is not carbon dioxide or uh, carbon monoxide or sulfur dioxide and, or nitrogen dioxide, all those forms of uh, pollution. So in that case, uh, uh, we will talk uh, uh, bef because before we cover the high temperature gas cooled reactor, uh, uh, we want to look at energy uh, decarbonization and uh, hydrogenation uh, in general. So that will we'll jump uh, ahead, uh, but we'll leave that. This is a chapter that we'll cover next time to justify why is it that we are in need to develop a high temperature gas cooled reactor? Because uh, the high temperature allows us to use chemical processes that, uh, or even just a, a high temperature electrolysis, uh, which would dissociate the water into hydrogen and auction. I will leave that to uh, next our next meeting and uh, cover the high temperature gas cooled reactors. 
I'll stop sharing uh, uh, and uh, we'll stop the uh, recording.